Hello, 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 everybody. I just heard a bang in the background somewhere. Um, welcome to the IOCDF Research Roundtable, the IOCDF live stream where we pick an interesting topic within the OCD literature and discuss it with people who know it really, really well. Um, today's topic is going to be OCD and depression. I'll say a little bit more about that in a little. Before that, though, I'm Kyle King. Um, I've been the host of the show for a little while now. Um, I'm a senior at Yale studying neuroscience, uh, and I, I have a particular interest in OCD, not only because I think it's a really interesting disorder, but also because I have it. I'm joined by my co-host, John Abramowitz. John, if you'd like to say a word about yourself. Sure. I'm John Abramowitz. I'm a professor in the psychology department, a clinical psychology program at the University of North Carolina. And I am fascinated by OCD. I, I happen to not have it, but it's been studying it for, you know, like, quarter century or more and doing therapy with folks. And um, yeah, I am fascinated by it and love um, learning more about it and helping folks with it. So, and I have enjoyed the past couple of years doing these um, shows with Kyle. As I, you, John. Um, and I'm super excited <laughs> to learn more about OCD today because this is a, a topic that um, I guess I've had a lot of questions about over the years in my own treatment. Um, and I'm excited to get to talk about it with two people who know a lot about this particular intersection. Um, but before I introduce our two guests today, I do have some announcements that I must cover. First, this live stream is educational and is not intended to replace therapy. For treatment-related questions, please work with your provider or contact a local clinician. You can use the IOCDS online resource directory at iocdf.org backslash find help to locate a trained clinician near you. Also, the International OCD Foundation is not a crisis hotline. If you're in a crisis, or if you're ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please call the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline by dialing 988. You can also access online at www.988lifeline.org or go to your local emergency room or call 911. Um, a third thing, we want this to, to be a safe space where everyone can share their ideas. We have a chat feature, um, and we love when you guys like send in questions. We want to take your questions from the chat and ask it to our experts and all that good stuff. Just know that whatever's put in the chat lives there forever. Um, so be respectful, though we've never had any particular problem. Um, all right, I think those are all the things that I need to blab about. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce our guests. The first guest bio on my little sheet here is Dr. Brad Riemann. So I'll start with you. Every time I see your name, I think of Riemann sums from calculus, which is probably an indication that I'm just a nerd. Um, <laughs> but anyway, Dr. Brad Riemann is a senior consultant working with a variety of behavioral health companies and academic institutions to develop evidence-based treatment programming, measurement-based care systems, and standardized training protocols. He's a former president of philanthropy research and clinical care at Rogers Behavioral Health. Among many responsibilities at Rogers, Dr. Riemann launched the development of the OCD and Anxiety Service line, serving approximately 600 OCD and anxiety patients per day. He's authored 120 scientific peer-reviewed articles on OCD and anxiety and is a member of the Scientific and Clinical Advisory Board of the IOCDF and the International OCD Accreditation Task Force. Recently, he launched the new adult OCD residential program in partnership with Ascension Alexion Brothers of Illinois. Dr. Riemann, we were talking about this backstage, but I feel like this is a good question to get the audience warmed up. Where were you for the eclipse and what were your thoughts? <laughs> well, uh, I was in southeastern Wisconsin where I've been born and raised. Uh, and we were kind of, we were very excited about it. Um, we were supposed to have 83% coverage. Um, however, I didn't really do enough homework to realize that 83% coverage means it's nearly as bright out as uh, if there was no eclipse whatsoever. So it was really a non-event, very disappointing here. Uh, but I know others, including our friend John here, had a wonderful experience. But yeah, that, that astronomy fascinates me, And, and uh, but it was kind of a bummer. Yeah, not, a, a non-event, unfortunately, Kyle. Yeah, well, same here in Connecticut. John did have a transformative experience, though. John, you could say a word about that really quickly. <laughs> so I went to Cleveland. My wife and I took a road trip uh, we have friends that live there, and it was it was transformative. So I've I've seen partial eclipses with the, the glass, <clears throat> see like the moon chipping out, you know, carving out from the sun. But to be in totality, it is three. It was like three and a half minutes. My jaw was like on the floor, just looking at the. You can take your glasses off during totality. You see the sun blocked out the corona, like the atmosphere of the sun. We saw sun like. Um, solar flare. Uh, there was one like pink solar flare. It gets dark. You see planets, things calm down. It gets cold. And we were with a whole group of people just 
the video I have is like everybody just saying, oh my God, oh my God. Yeah. If you have a chance, anyone out there, if you have a chance to see a total eclipse and be in totality, don't miss it. It is, it is really worth it. And John, think about what people would have experienced a thousand years ago who, who just yeah. woke up one day and that happened. Right? Yeah, I mean, they didn't know. know. I, mean, I mean, you would think the world was coming to an end probably. So th right? There's a story that um, somewhere in the Middle East, like, you know, in the BCs, before they knew how to predict these things, there was a war going on. And, you know, just, just randomly, there happened to be an eclipse in the middle of and those yeah. days they fought wars on battlefields. And they thought, the two sides thought that like, you know, the gods were telling them stop fighting and they stopped fighting after that because they were like freaked out. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Hmm. You see, John, I invoked calculus earlier and yet you still come off more nerdy than me. It's really, it's really impressive. I have a way of coming off more nerdy than most people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our, our other guest here is Dr. Jason Krompinger. Um, I said that right, correctly? Yeah, you did. Yeah. Cool. Um, he's a board certified clinical psychologist and a specialist at, with a specialty in treating obsessive compulsive and related disorders. He's the director of clinical training at the New England Center for OCD and Anxiety, a faculty member at the International OCD Foundation's Behavioral Therapy Training Institute, and a lecturer at Harvard Medical School. He held various clinical and leadership positions at the McLean OCD Institute from 2011 to 2022. In his current role, he finds great joy in supervising and consulting with students, postdocs, early career psychologists, and seasoned clinicians. He's co-authored several articles and delivered many talks, seminars, and community trainings on OCD. Jason, I didn't hear where, where you were actually for the eclipse and what your, your thoughts I was here. I was here in Cambridge, Mass, and I was actually in session. I just kind of noticed that it was kind of, I was in the thick of it, and I noticed it was a little bit dark, and it was only later that I was like, oh, right, that. You were the most underwhelmed by a lot of Very the <laughs> <laughs> It was a minor inconvenience to me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, you should talk to John after then, argue with him. But, <laughs> we're going to have to talk to you. Yeah. Oh, so today we're going to be talking about, like I mentioned, OCD and depression. Um, this is something that, you know, me and my parents have talked about a lot uh, over the years, particularly when I was getting treatment for OCD, because um, I would have depressive symptoms pop up and then we'd have like talks about, you know, what does it mean to have depression and do I have depression? Um, and it's also one of those disorders that's kind of entered the popular zeitgeist and I guess feels like it's thrown around a lot. Um, so this is a good opportunity to like talk about depression a little bit more clinically and talk about it in relation to OCD. Um, so I, I figured we might as well start or I might as well start my questioning there. And then for everyone watching, pop your questions in the chat um, and I will interrogate our experts. Um, I'm, I'm, first, just say, I'm, I'm just really impressed, Kyle, that you snuck the word zeitgeist in. in yeah, yeah. I wanted to reclaim nerdiest on the panel. Um, <laughs> So what is uh, what is depression? Like, what is kind of the clinical definition of this term for anyone? Boy, Jason. You're right. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> and bust it out, you know. Um, yeah, it's, it's a constellation of, of symptoms, and it can actually, in a, in a way, it's kind of similar to OCD. It's pretty heterogeneous. It can show up differently for different people. You know, for some, it's the the phrase we might have used is kind of neurovegetative, kind of loss of energy, loss of interest, um, anhedonia, uh, you know, just inability to do the things that you're typically into doing, that sort of thing, just not feeling life, not feeling the ability to get out of bed. Um, you know, for others, it can be more about the emotionality of it, just a lot of perpetual feelings of worthlessness or hopelessness or guilt, of course, sadness. If I didn't say that, if you Think that would have been the first thing that I said, but that wasn't the first thing that I said because I think just the, I think to me that actually speaks a little bit to the heterogeneity. Is that I, the the first image that came to my mind was more the neurovegetative stuff, but um, you know, persistent experience, uh, persistent extended episodes of uh, of sadness, um, again hopelessness, worthlessness, uh, guilt. Um, one of those things, and we'll probably get into this more. Um, there are some features I think of depression that are are pretty transdiagnostic, um, and a big one is rumination. Uh, I think historically that's kind of seen seen as a, a, a indicator of depression or a symptom of depression, a perpetuator of depression um, that can certainly show up and show up in OCD <laughs> and disorders as well. Um, so it's kind of a start. I mean, I think the the important maybe points to make right now is that it's, you know, everybody gets sad, you know, everybody has periods of time in their life where they're feeling a lack of interest in, in things that they're typically interested in. But 
this is an extended period of time that causes a, a pretty significant impairment in, in daily functioning. Yeah, and the only thing I would add, great, great uh, summary there, Jason. But the only thing I would add is, you know, keep in mind if you are working with kids, it can present quite differently. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you might see some somatic complaints, a lot of tummy aches and headaches, um, like acting out can even be acting out aggressively. So just keep in mind, it can manifest itself differently in, in kids and adolescents than adults. And obviously, commonly co-occurs with OCD, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we found that about 85% of our patients in these intensive levels of care, at least, uh, had a significant level of, of mood disturbance or depression. And when you think about how bad and awful OCD is, to me, it kind of makes sense uh, that people also feel depressed, uh, you know, to Jason's point, kind of feeling hopeless and helpless. Um, you know, it's just such a disabling condition. Uh, and, and I always kind of was in awe of patients who had OCD who weren't depressed. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's somehow the, the resilience of, of, of them and, and despite having OCD, they were able to kind of persevere and not get down about it. Um, but it's a common comorbid condition. And clearly, clinically, I would encourage all that are listening to be monitoring depression levels in addition to OCD symptoms uh, in terms of admission and through progress. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that a bunch of questions just popped up in my head um, in a number of different directions. But I guess we started talking a little bit about OCD. So I'll start asking questions about that. Um, in your answer there, Dr. Riemann, it's the to me, there seems to be an implication of causality. Like I have OCD, OCD sucks. Therefore, I start experiencing the symptoms of depression. Is that the case? Is that like in, in my experience and in my opinion, it is the rule that that is the case. In other words, you know, um, if you think about the World Health Organization found that OCD is the 10th leading cause of disability in the world, right? It, it's a bad thing to have. It interferes with your life occupationally, academically, relationship-wise. So again, to me, it makes sense that someone is going to start to feel depressed because OCD is just such a terrible thing to have, right? Um, what we found in most cases, um, and I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but in most cases, uh, we could focus in on the OCD, reduce the symptoms of OCD, and you saw the depression kind of come along for the ride. You saw the subsequent reduction in depression because they were feeling less anxious, right? But, you know, and certainly our friend John did, you know, one of the really important studies, I think way back in 2004, maybe, John, where you published about the, the interfering effects of OCD treatment with severe depression, right? We can talk more about that later, but but the idea is, in my opinion, it seems to be, again, fairly natural to start having mood disturbances because of OCD. But if you focus in, you do good ERP, you do good work for the OCD, generally you do see a reduction in that, um, in that depression level as well. But that's why it's so important to monitor, mm -hmm. because if it doesn't start coming along for the ride, you better address that as well. I think I'm going to, I, I agree with that. Um, I think I'm, I'll add also, it's super important to conceptualize the case. Um, so I agree plenty of cases, just clinically speaking, you know, plenty of cases where you might say like depression is kind of a function of the OCD, like what, what Brad's describing. Um, and also there are cases where the depression is kind of inextricably linked in with the OCD. So in cases where the OCD, uh, has implications for the person, like themselves as a human being, and kind of my image of myself, if that makes sense. So I have these intrusive thoughts, and it's not just that I have these ego dystonic thoughts that I just I don't uh, that are scary, just intrinsically because the images are terrifying, and I don't want to have them. It's also this kind of deep, like, well, also fundamentally, I feel like I am maybe not who I think that I am, or all that I should be, or a bad person in some fundamental way. That could be a reason why somebody would sort of rail against those thoughts and sort of set, set the stage for OCD, but that could be also a, a node in the depression network as well, you know? So mm -hmm. I think they can be pretty uh, inextricably, and actually inextricably quite linked in that way as, as well. That can sort of show up in that form. Okay. So it's typically, you know, I've kind of gone back and forth talking with my mom about this and like we both don't research this particular intersection. Um, 
but so it's typically not conceived of as like you have OCD and then depression is this like separate thing um, that persists after OCD and, and came before it and like has distinct neurobiological correlates going on. Um, it's oftentimes, at least from your guys' perspective, thought of as like something that comes like the OCD comes first. Well, it can. I mean, it can be both. Right. So there are some folks who their depression is linked to the OCD. Right. And, and they develop depressive symptoms after they started you know, developing problems with OCD. And if you ask them, hey, you know, uh, if we treated your OCD, how would how do you think your depression would respond? They would say, yeah, it would go away. I'm just depressed about having OCD because, as you know, Brad and Jason said, OCD is a pretty depressing you know, problem. And then there are other folks who have, you know, kind of it's it's separate and there might be some, you know, links. Yeah, OCD doesn't help the depression, contributes to it, but they might have depression. <clears throat> they might have had it, you know, before they developed OCD. They might be depressed about other things besides OCD. Um, I don't yeah. know. You know, yeah. Pattern. Yeah. No, I, I think that's absolutely right, John. And, you know, so Kyle, I think, you know, what I had said is kind of the rule and I define mm -hmm. rule as 51% or more. Right. So it, okay. I think it's more, in my experience, it's more common that it is because of the OCD. But there are people, as John is saying, who it persists. It may predate it. It may be that it just has spun off and kind of it's it's its own problem. I, uh, and needs to be addressed. The other thing too that I think is important is, you know, uh, there are plenty of people, especially in the intensive levels of care, um, you know, where this has been so disruptive to their lives. They come in for treatment. We uh, we help them reduce their hand washing, their praying, counting, checking, whatever it might be, and then they kind of look at us and go, "Well, now what?" Um, you know, I'm 22 years old. Despite being very bright, you know, I've really struggled in school. Um, don't have a lot of friends, unfortunately, have never been on a date because I've had bad OCD since I was 12. And so sometimes the, the mood issue persists because even though, you know, we've sucked as much OCD out of the system, there's still now, you know, kind of a road to hold to, to kind of get their, their quality of life back on track. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and they, and they now hopefully have a path, but they also understand that there's still a lot of work to do to kind of get them back selves back on track. So, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it never say never, never say ever. I mean, it, you know, it's, it, there, are, there are rules and exceptions, but certainly this can be a freestanding problem that predates OCD and needs to be addressed in addition to OCD. Okay. And like, yeah, so I, I'm glad that we defined what you meant by rule. Cause when you said rule, I thought like maybe 90% or more. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways depression can like be added into this equation. One question I had when I was reading stuff was, you know, you said 85%, at least in the, in the people who are in residential um, with OCD also have depression. What's the prevalence of OCD in people who like have, I guess, the other way, <laughs> like what percent of people with depression also have OCD? Yeah. So you mean if you were to look at a depressed sample? Yes. Flipping the coin over? You know, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not aware of that study actually being done. I'm, I'm, I would like to hear my colleagues here, but, uh, you know, keep in mind, Kyle, I mean, mental health issues, behavioral health issues commonly co-occur. So I would, I would assume it's high, but I don't know of any study. How about you guys? Yeah, I would just say I would assume it's higher than an average, an unselected population. Uh, yeah. I don't know the yeah. stats. Yeah. yeah. Just because yeah. what you said, Brad, that just, you know, if you have one you know, psychiatric diagnosis, you're more likely to have another and depression is certainly a common one. So I would expect it to be elevated, but I don't think we have data on that. No. Yeah. And you, and you wonder if, if we don't have data and I'm just speculating now, but because maybe if, if you have OCD, assuming you enter the behavioral health treatment world, maybe that's the door you're more likely to go through than the depression door, but hard to say. Yeah. Oh, I see. So like the OCD would be the impetus for like starting care and then more so than depression, maybe. Uh, it's just speculation. Uh, yeah. What percent of the population has depression? That's a great question. And boy, does it vary depending on the study you look at. But <laughs> okay. it's, it's a lot. I mean, I, I've seen I've seen prevalence rates as high as 10 percent. I, I don't know what you guys have seen. but Yeah, same thing.
But it, yeah. it varies. It varies in the population, you know, and the sample that you're looking at, and and all that general population. You know, I, I give me a second. I will look that up from the most recent like population studies. I can find. Yeah, that. great. Thank you. The thing that you mentioned, Brad, I just want to comment on was this. Uh, you know, this kind of phenomenon where somebody, particularly those who are going under, going through intensive treatment. Um, mm -hmm. And they do well, they do better with their OCD. There is this kind of, this acknowledgement that, right, and now I'm, you know, let's say I'm 22 years old and right. developmentally I feel like I'm not where I would otherwise be if I didn't have OCD and I've got all this catch up to to do. It, it's, there's, it's almost like some grief work that you're doing at a certain point yep. sort of yep. around that. So again, just thinking about, we talk about depression being heterogeneous to understand well, what what is it really fundamentally about for you specifically? Mm -hmm. I think could very well be that piece. Yeah, and Jason, I think you're bringing up a good point. I mean, some of it is just even grieving kind of what they've missed. I mean, right. so I was kind of presenting it of, okay, I still have a lot more work to do. But to your point, there's also sometimes just this grief of the loss of my adolescence exactly. yep. because I had really bad OCD, right? That's a great point. Totally. And I mean, I'm sure there's people who are watching this now and are going to watch this that resonate a lot with what you guys just said. So like, what, what do you reckon, like, what would you do with a patient who's expressing either the grief of their adolescence or this like fear of all the things to come now? Yeah. I mean, I, I think a, 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 this might sound overly simple just to start, but just even acknowledging and talking about it first and validating that this is part of the experience. I think that sometimes it just is and speaking kind of like anecdotally slash clinically um, folks, again, can go through a lot of treatment and get a lot of help, um, get a lot of good cheerleading from communities like this one, right? Like the IOCDF. Um, and then all these kind of rules start showing up about how I'm supposed to feel about it. You know, okay, well now I'm supposed to just be grateful. <laughs> I'm supposed to, you know, these are all the ways that I should be. Um, but then they don't. And it's sort of like, oh gosh, like shouldn't I, like kind of grappling with that. So mm -hmm. a big piece of it is, Again, acknowledging that this is not uncommon at all, that you would have this kind of grief, the same kind of work that we would do with any kind of difficult inner experience, recognize it, notice kind of what it pulls for you to do, if it pulls for you to ruminate, avoid, isolate, disengage, do all these other maladaptive things that we would want to help people not do, and then orient towards value behavior, orient towards uh, you know behavioral activation, identifying problematic thoughts, et cetera, usual kind of you know evidence-based approaches that we would use for Anything else? What do you got, John? <laughs> in, ad, in, in adults over 12, the prevalence rate in a meta-analysis done in 2022 was 9.2% uh, had, had had like a major depressive, you know, episode in the past year. And, um, and the prevalence is on the rise, um, unfortunately. And over 34% report depressive symptoms. So that's kind of where we're, what we're talking about. Yeah, and that's in the general population, not not people. Yeah, yeah. So you said behavioral activation. I just want to make sure everyone's like clear what that is. What what is that, and and what's it for? Uh, behavioral activation is uh, kind of one of these existing, like kind of long-standing, empirically supported interventions for depression, um, and developed you know decades ago. And you know, I don't want to oversimplify it too much, but I always say it's basically doing stuff. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 you know, in a, in a, in a mindful and sort of a, a very yeah. intentional way and in the, in a way that sort of acknowledges the, the struggles that come with that, but, uh, you know, planning to, first of all, you know, identifying mm -hmm. what's important to me, like, what do I want to practice devoting my energies towards, um, what moves me toward better towards a life that I want to be living and then scheduling those kinds of activities. And, and I actually see a lot of just phenomenologically, I feel like there's a lot of overlap between behavioral activation for depression and ERP, for example, in terms of there's a lot of challenges, a lot of challenging feelings that come up in, you know, taking a walk, for example, or calling a friend you hadn't spoken to in years. Uh, so that's yeah. one of those existing treatments for depression that's a go-to for like, CBT people. Yeah, Jason, I was laughing because, you know, Jonathan Cantor probably would not say it's that, <laughs> that yeah. simple. I, I know what you're saying. But, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, Kyle, I think the, the premise is that most people acknowledge that there's a relationship between mood and activity level. And the more mm -hmm. active you are, usually the more elevated your mood and the less active you are, you know, the poorer your mood state. And to Jason's point earlier, 
you know, depression tends to sap people of motivation, energy. You get this anhedonia where you don't enjoy pleasurable activities as much as you used to. And it's really kind of this anchor that pulls people down and their activity level goes down. And, and the idea is, um, you know, doing stuff like Jason said, you know, becoming more active. But what I would say um, is that the, there is there is a, a method to this. And, and if you go about this from a clinical perspective, uh, similar, uh, as Jason said, to kind of building an exposure hierarchy, we would build a BA hierarchy where we would identify you know, pleasurable activities that they no longer engaged in, accomplishment related activities that by the nature of them don't bring enjoyment, but bring a sense of accomplishment and boost your mood. And then you've got to be kind of thoughtful about how you fold this stuff in, because if someone is really, really inactive, I mean, if they're having a hard time with their, you know, their ADLs, their activities of daily living, you, you can't expect them to go for a two mile walk, right? So, I mean, you've got to be mindful of of kind of folding these things in, in a, in a challenging, but manageable hierarchical fashion. And it really, really boosts mood. Now, the, the other thing that Cantor added, in addition to kind of that activity scheduling is what we called it when I was in graduate school is tying values into it to try to boost compliance. Mm -hmm. So activity scheduling in and of itself works for those who do it. Compliance wasn't great. So tying it into things that were held in high value. You know, I want to be a good father. If you tie these activities in with that value, you just get a higher rate of compliance. But we BA was our depression. Well, it is, I'll say, our depression intervention of choice. And, and the reason being, um, you know, is not necessarily that it's any more effective, but it was easier for me to train our clinical teams in BA than, say, cognitive restructuring, which I think is a pretty sophisticated technique. And it was easier for our staff to train our patients in BA than cognitive restructuring. So for me, it was always the kind of the, the tie went to the simplest, if you will, just in terms of being able to implement it and scale it, you know, on a large system. Yeah. BA just got a shout out. Uh, the last comment from Katie. Also, Ashton Pizza offered his definition of BA, which I really hope his last name is Ashton P is Pizza, actually, um, at 1224. And he said, I think of behavioral activation of I don't feel good, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, which That's when I important. read that, that sounds a lot like exposure to me, too. <laughs> I don't feel good yeah. about it. But I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Yeah, And what happens when people do that is, you know, in addition to, you know, getting up and, and um you know, and, and do, doing stuff as I guess we're affectionately calling it, they're getting reinforcement. Oh, the, the behavioral model of depression is a lack of positive reinforcement leads one to kind of miss out on getting, you know, positive responses and feedback about themselves. The more you go out, you smile at people, you talk to someone, you exercise, you feel like you accomplish something that makes you feel better. That's reinforcing. You want to do it more and more. Um, and, and you start behaving like a person who's not depressed, and then it becomes an upward spiral. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And and don't be fooled by the word activation. I mean, uh, yes, physically activating things like exercise is very helpful, but it can even be, you know, an enjoyable sedentary yeah. activity like reading a novel. You know, you just have always enjoyed reading, but you've kind of given it up because of your depressed mood. So it, it doesn't have to be physically active to be effective. Um, by the way, Ashton Pizza did just confirm that his last name is truly Pizza. Um, That's awesome. <laughs> yes, it's phenomenal. Um, so before we talk a little bit about treatment, I I have this question. I wrote down a list of questions. Um, this is something that I've wondered for years. And if I've wondered it, then I'm sure someone else in the stream must have. Um, if, if like you have OCD, so we've talked about how depression can factor into OCD in a number of different ways. It can come after, it can be standing before, or there's, it can sometimes be a function of the OCD itself. Um, in that third case where it's a function of, of the OCD, why give a diagnosis of depression at all? I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm actually, I don't mean to, I'm not trying to be, to be funny. I think that to me, that's, that's the, the case to be made for, you know, moving towards this model where we're thinking of, of these conditions as a collection of things, you know, a collection of inter, inter kind of interconnected nodes, you know, this is a network model stuff. I know, you know Brett, you, you've done plenty of work in and 
Yeah, so for sure, there are certain elements that may be kind of more on the depressive kind of side of things and there are others that are more on the OCD side of things, but then there are these that have plenty of overlap. And, you know, I'll, I'll always have that kind of conversation with folks where like, we don't, we don't, we can call this whatever we want, but, you know, let's, 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 uh, let's set up our treatment to address these specific processes that are kind of keeping this whole thing afloat. And, you know, as opposed to getting bogged down and like, well, this is for, we're doing this for this diagnosis and doing this for this diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great point. And as Jason pointed out, kind of these nodes or these networks, you know, pathways, one thing leading to another. And, but I mean, we, you know, it, clinically, uh, you know, we live in a world of, of, uh, you know, third party payer insurance companies and, and we've got to have our diagnoses. And, and one of the things I would just say is when you get in into intensive levels of care, and I don't mean just residential, intensive outpatient day treatment kind of programs. Um, one of the things that uh, is important to do, you know, is have an accurate diagnostic profile, which can leverage with the payer to authorize higher levels of care, because it's not just OCD, it's OCD and major depressive disorder. And so sometimes it's just the practicalities of the insurance healthcare system we live in, mm -hmm. that it's important to be, you know, putting those things in there. But, um, you know, obviously to Jason's point, you're going to be applying whatever treatments you need to get a patient better, regardless of DSM criteria. But, yeah. yeah. Could you, um, Brad, cause I saw your name attached to a lot of things that talked about the network model. Um, could you kind of elaborate on like what that is and, and what you mean by nodes and how these nodes connect? <laughs> I was confused so, when I was so, so at, at risk of, of, of simplifying like Jason did for the behavioral <laughs> activation, um, you know, I mean, this is a very, very, very sophisticated uh, kind of statistical uh, analysis that is applied to symptoms as a whole. And it's really fascinating stuff. And, and uh, you know, my old advisor from graduate school, Rich McNally, who's at Harvard now, is has really done a lot of this work with his colleagues. And and, uh, you know, I mean, the idea is kind of just exactly what Jason was saying is this is it tries to kind of create somewhat of a, a path and a chicken and an egg kind of thing. I mean, what kind of comes first and what leads to something else? And it answers some really, really important questions. Let me just give you an example. One of yes. the things we took a look at was sleep disturbance and whether sleep disturbance in OCD uh, affected treatment outcome, right? And so there are, you know, like on your quick inventory of depressive symptomatology or your Beck depression inventory, there's always a sleep question, right? And so we kind of took the score there and 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 it just, it, it kind of just creates this little bit of a pathway that tries to lighten, you know, do, do you have to address, and I mean, here's the other thing, we were talking about, do you have to address depression, right? And mm -hmm. we we're kind of saying sometimes yes, sometimes no. If you have sleep disturbance, do you have to address that? Or by treating the OCD, will the sleep disturbance kind of take care of itself? And and it's just a it's it's a very different way of looking at things. I mean, it it is it is. I don't know, John and Jason, if you would agree, but I mean, it, it almost kind of is consistent with more of this kind of transdiagnostic thing. I mean, looking at the symptoms of the patient and and. And yeah. what leads to what versus the diagnosis? If I can share my screen, I've got so here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let's try this out here. I would can get folks... nervous when John tries new technology things. <laughs> I, uh, so maybe, uh, there we go. Okay. So, hey, so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a paper. So Sam Samantha Helberg. Actually, this is my this is my my whole lab uh, from a couple of years ago. We did this study, 2022. Samantha Helberg is the first author. She's a wonderful grad student. She's on internship, and this is kind of the main result. This is this is the the network um, uh, showing. So these are different symptoms of of depression. So this is insomnia. This is cognitive and somatic. So you're thinking, and you're kind of what what uh, Jason and Brad were talking about: how you feel, how you think. Um, WA refers to weight and appetite symptoms. Often folks gain or lose weight, increase lower appetite sometimes depending on the person. NGA is negative affect. So that's like the typical, like what you think of as depression, your affect is kind of like, you know, how you doing and negative affect means you're feeling sad and blue and down. 
And this is compulsions and obsessions over here. And what it shows is that the symptoms of OCD are generally separate from those of depression, but they're linked. So the stronger and more green the, the linkage here, that means the symptoms relate to one another in the analysis, they're linked through negative affect. And it's particularly obsessions and negative affect, which is what you would which is what you would expect. But this is a this is a network analysis. Um, this is kind of the 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 output that you get when you do one of these things. And it really, as Brad was saying, it enables you to be able to look at the relationship among different symptoms in a way that you know regular statistics don't don't do mm -hmm. very easily. I guess like what what look what, what what clinical information do you glean from this sort of thing that but, yeah no, that's a really good question if you don't mind. I think this yeah, is cool. awesome. <laughs> I think this stuff is so fun. Um, and you know, I'd love to to hear just from more from John and, and Brad about this. And, and correct me if like I'm not. This is not how I should be thinking about it. So we actually used to do some of this stuff at McLean, where you know, we'd work with, uh, we'd have patients. We do like their their little kind of ideographic network, you know, to kind of figure out well, what is this for mm -hmm. you. And one of the coolest things I think about this these analyses is that you can identify nodes that are sort of more important, so to speak, like the nodes that are sort of like the the keystones that are holding up the house, you know, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we, for example, we'd, we'd often, we'd, I say often, but in a couple of like key instances I'm thinking of, find that guilt, for example, upheld obsessions and compulsions and distress, but also was linked very strongly to depressive symptoms too. So organizing treatment around addressing one's relationship with guilt in that case was important. And and guilt would go with the uh, negative affect for sure. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, th I think clinically, you know, this, so this is not for an individual patient. This is group level data. So everyone's going to be a little bit different. You know, this is hundreds of, of folks. Um, and actually, it might even come from old Rogers data, Brad, that you that we yeah. used to have been on back in the day. Um, although it, it's not because you would have been an author on that. And I didn't see you as an author. Um, but this is or uh, wait a minute. Are you? Yeah, Brad was there. You are an author. Yeah, this is. You, how about that? Yeah. yeah how so, could you forget uh, that? So Brad ought to be able to come just as You're well as I can. You're still thinking about the eclipse. You're still in Cleveland. I, I am. I'm still the program. Program. Um, But yeah, but so this, what this is telling us is that overall, you know, if you look at the averages, the the association between depression and, and OCD seems to have something to do with this negative affect, this link between negative affect and obsessions, which are, you know, they're they're the distressing, you know, part of, of, of OCD, these are unwanted intrusive thoughts that we know they provoke distress. They also provoke compulsions. And that's, you know, it's the association with compulsions is even stronger than it is. Uh, the association with compulsions is even stronger with obsessions than depression is with obsessions, but that's where the link is. And so somebody, mm -hmm. one of either Brad or Jason said earlier, like you would want to address treatment by looking at, you know, interventions that target negative affect because that's going to get you more bang for your buck. Yeah. So, I mean, how does like Jason, I feel like this is a good question for you. How does this change the way you structure ERP or something like that? Well, you know, it, for example, if let's say, let's say the particular ne negative affect that was holding up everything was guilt. You know, what I wouldn't, and, you know, this is what you'd want to be doing anyway, but for just the top of my head, the, if you, you're setting up an exposure, right, where I'm trying to think of like an example of a, a, of a OCD, it could be, you know, like a moral scrupulosity thing where I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to do minor things that inconvenience people like, uh, you know, some, somebody getting like bump in, like accidentally bump into them or something <laughs> when I'm walking, when I'm walking down the hallway. Um, you know, what I wouldn't want, I, I guess I'd be really zeroing in on what is the person learning from doing these exposures? You know, they're doing the exposure. Yeah. And they're not, ritualizing but they're kind of just stewing in their guilt you know and they're just sort of thinking about <laughs> ruminating on how bad of a person they are and like mm -hmm. okay well i'm not doing my mental review i'm not doing my reassurance seeking or uh, or uh, you know confessing but i am doing that you know which maybe they don't even say, see as part of ocd it's just kind of part of their experience and you're not really doing much to address their relationship with guilt i think in that case compared to this kind of like frame around the exposure where Hey, we're practicing. Yeah, we're going to practice doing this thing to minorly inconvenience people, but it's going to be about showing yourself that you're allowed to literally take up space in this world. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, okay. You know what I mean? And, and it's not necessarily like in this. My I don't know. My, my burst in the flame saying this, but you you don't have to be guilty for 
whether you inconvenience people or not, you know, you're you're allowed. Um, sure. And again, sort of ha having that frame, I think, is what I'd, I'd make sure I'd really put some energies into if if I knew that that was a, a key piece of their yeah end depression. So it sounds like the, the the exposure itself is pretty similar to something that wouldn't be informed by one of these network models. But then the way you frame the discussion yeah. afterwards is, or the discussion before, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Before or after. Yep. Processing it. Yep. Exactly. Okay. That's really good. Brad, I don't know if you have anything to add about that. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's exactly right. And I mean, the only other thing besides perhaps the framing of it would be the possibility, at least in some cases, that you might have to intervene on that negative affect. I mean, you know, if it's if it's shame, yep. guilt because of having repugnant thoughts, yep. you know, uh, harm obsessions, you know, those kinds of things. So you might have to do a little bit of work in that area as well, um, because that could, in theory, be an obstacle to getting people to respond to that ERP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, go ahead. Good. I was going to change the topic a little bit. So you sure. can finish. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I, there's a comment at 1229 from Katya, uh, and she sa said, can you cover the feelings that can come with OCD that can look like depression? Um, and given kind of what we're talking about now, which is like, I guess, almost rebuking like the, the, these cold cut diagnoses. Um, I, how do you guys, what do you guys think of that question? And what are some, like Jason, you mentioned rumination at the top and that to me doesn't seem like something I'd associate with depression. It sounds like OCD. Um, it's so is it, just, just to clarify, is the question, uh, could there be symptoms of OCD that uh, are that actually looks, OCD symptoms that could be mistaken for symptoms of depression? Is that the question? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Go ahead, Jason. Well, okay. <laughs> well that's definitely true. You know, you, yeah. you, that's why you always have to be paying attention to function of behavior, right? So why is somebody staying in bed? Um, you know, is it because they feel like they're worthless or is it because they feel like if I get out of bed, I'm going to create some harm that I'll never be able to sort of rebound yeah. from? Um, you know, they, again, with as far as feelings go, you know, it's hard to... You know, aside from the broad strokes, like we said at the beginning, plenty of feelings, you know, can sh that there are hardly feelings, I think, that are just exclusive to one or the other. You know, there are plenty of, like guilt, shame, this, like what like Brad mentioned, um, disgust. You know, those are all experiences that are common to OCD that are, of course, common to depression as well. Um, so anxiety is common to depression as well. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I don't know that. So it, it can it, it kind of. It warrants again careful conceptualization, which is you know an evaluation of the function of somebody's behavior to understand is it more like an OCD thing versus more mm -hmm. than thing. Um, and it's funny to hear you say that about rumination because yeah, I had the opposite just in my upbringing, the opposite experience where I I actually was in you know went into grad school more just into depression work, um, and I read all Susan Nolan Hoxima's work and it was all this depression, depression, depression. You know, the rumination was tied to depression, and then. You know, I was thinking, hey, why aren't we talking about this enough in OCD? And I know over the past like 10, 15 years or so, I feel like we're talking about it more in OCD. So again, it's very, I think, transdiagnostic. Um, so again, yeah, that as well can be can show up in both. Yeah, Kyle, I mean, there is a difference between rumination and, and an obsession. I mean, it, it, yeah. now, and I would just say, I don't know how everybody else, you know, John or Jason, you feel. I mean, I think it's kind of the 80-20 rule for me. I mean, I think 80% of the time, those things are quite distinct. Yeah. There's a, you know, 10 to 20% of the time where it gets a little gray. You know, but I mean, might know, as well then define it exactly because you know, ruminations tend to be past focused, right? I mean, regrets, mm -hmm. these kinds of things about the past, whereas you know, obsessions tend to be about future consequences, you know, future terrible things happening. Uh, you know, I'm going to get sick and die. I'm going to go to hell, or or you know, whatever it might be. So I mean, that it is it is important to separate. But of course, we talked about the comorbidity of, of depression and OCD being so common. In many cases, you're going to get a person who has a blend of both of those symptoms. Yeah. yeah and, and in depression, usually the ruminations <laughs> focus on like overly, like generally negative things about yourself, the world, the future. Woe is me. I'm no good. The world's terrible. Whereas in yeah. obsessions, you usually see something specific. So if it, because sometimes yeah. you do have people focusing on like, maybe I hit someone with my car or maybe I, you know, something in the past, but it's focused on one thing, not like I'm a bad person, all the failures that I've had, those kinds of things. But it can be hard to tease. Great point. Yeah, great point. 
so like those ruminations and depression, like I'm a bad person. I mean, when you say they're not, they, they often don't come with these specific instances. It's just like a general thought that I'm a bad person without thinking of like evidence that would say well, that. that. And that's one of the, the cognitive, you know, mistakes, those kinds of thinking patterns, the stories that people with depression tell themselves get really focused on, you know, things that are negative about themselves. And then they look for evidence to confirm that. So remember when I did this, that, and the other thing that weren't so good, that just proves how bad of a person I am. And they ignore evidence to the contrary. What about all the great things you've done and the nice things you've done? Well, yeah. let's explain those away. Those don't really count. People with depression research shows us they have biased cognitive processing, biased information processing, where they focus more on the negatives. Even if it's a few negatives and a lot of positives, people who have depression tend to really <laughs> magnify those negatives and kind of minimize those positives in their life. And in addition to that, John, there's that misinterpretation or uh, bias where they yeah. interpret ambiguous information as negative. That's right. Yeah. So, it, yeah. so it looks like, you know, people- Everything's the, cloudy, yeah. Yeah, they, they look at life through blue colored glasses. Um, so it looks, yeah, like everything's- Yeah. Like, I mean, that misinterpretation bias to me sounds like something that could also show up in OCD. Oh, yeah. Like thinking yeah. back on past events. Yeah. Yeah. We, 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 you know, Kyle, we tend to think about it. There's kind of three cognitive biases, right? There's a, a an attention bias for threat. They tend to be, you know, have their radar out for threat cues. There's a misinterpret, you know, or an interpretation bias where they interpret ambiguous information as threatening. And then there's a memory bias. They tend to not forget those things. Um, all leading to, you know, and, and then we, t you know, kind of talk about these as, you know, kind of cognitive predispositions, if you will, of, of anxiety disorders and OCD. And that's what, because those processes that Brad's <laughs> talking about, they're very similar. They might focus on different topics. Person with OCD focuses on threat. Person with depression focuses on the kind of negative that views about themselves in the world. But that's probably why we see so much overlap between a lot of these problems, the anxiety yeah. related problems, depression, um, things like that. Because, uh, you know, when we look at them from a psychological perspective, a cognitive behavioral perspective, not the DSM, but looking even more carefully, um, we see so much overlap in the thinking mechanisms that are driving these problems. Mm -hmm. um, I want to pivot to treatment. Well, well, we still have time to talk about it because I think a lot of people in the chat want to hear. Um, Boris, I don't know if you can put this comment up. Boris is the guy, the SDF backstage. Um, put this comment up, but Jessica just put in the chat. Um, I'll read it out for the time being. Um, oh, no, the one above that, Boris. <laughs> there we go. I'm tired of hearing that ERP is the gold standard. Many clients first need to address other issues like depression. Um, one therapist told my son, I can't help you unless you do ERP. Um and I think this is a good way to open up the conversation of like, what do you do when a patient presents with OCD and depression? Um, and how does that change the way the treatment happens? Yeah, I think we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but, um, you know, it's really taking this whole person approach, you know, to what's going on. And instead of seeing somebody as a collection of, of, of diagnoses, you know, um, and I think, again, it's what I love about some of this network stuff is that we can sort of be more specific and more precise about what exactly are the things that need to be addressed. And some of those things might not necessarily be ERP, like you know, to this to this comment, like what Brad was mentioning before about, you know, maybe there's some, re I don't know if this is what you're alluding to, but there's some work to do around certain uh certain beliefs that somebody might have about thoughts in general or about themselves. And it's more sort of cognitive work, you know, other than other than more traditional forms of kind of behavioral intervention for OCD, then we've got to, we have to have the tools to sort of do that. So yeah, I think it, it really sort of starts with that kind of more precise assessment of what's going on to inform what we then do. Yeah. And, and to this, this person's uh, comment, I mean, uh, it is possible that the depression would have to be addressed first. I mean, you know, remember, Kyle, I was talking about rules and exceptions. Mm -hmm. The rule I have found is that you don't have to treat the depression first. In fact, you don't even have to tre treat it simultaneously. The rule, 51% or more, is it goes away with uh, the OCD symptoms. However, there are exceptions. And for some, 
you have to treat them simultaneously because it's it's really severe depression. And I alluded to a study that John did in 2004, but he found mm. that severe depression interfered with OCD treatment outcome, right? Um, and, and in some cases, the, the depression may be so profound that it has to be addressed first to this to this person's comment. I mean, it, it's it's that that can happen. Now, again, I have found that that is an exception, not the rule. But um, you know, you just to Jason's point. I mean, you've got to take a look at the entire profile of of the of the patient in totality um, and and game plan accordingly. The other thing that I would just like to mention, you know, is I have found that if you just lump ERP into this kind of generic category, it's not like a precise medical intervention where, you know, um, 20 milligrams of this is 20 milligrams of that. I mean, there's no quality issue. There's, you know, there's a quantity issue, which I'm going to get back to more and more, but it's, it's, it, you're, you're getting that treatment. Quality in terms of ERP is, is still a problem, right? Uh, there are people who say they do ERP, um, and there are some who do it, of course, very, very, very well. But, you know, I think in terms of conceptualizing treatment for OCD, you've got to think about the quality of that intervention, and then you have to think about the quantity. And in my opinion, there is a dosage effect between the severity and complexity of the OCD, and keep in mind, complexity could be comorbid depression, right? Mm -hmm between the severity and the complexity of, of their OCD and how much high quality ERP someone needs to get better. Um, if you are having to simultaneously treat ERP, uh, OCD and depression, say with ERP and behavioral activation, your 50 minute sessions divided between two worlds. You're, you're not able to give the full dose of that single session to the OCD. Uh, that may be one of the reasons why severe depression in John's study was found to interfere with outcomes because you're kind of trying to divide and conquer, but it, 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 you don't have a lot of time. Uh, increasing dose, and, and, and for any clinicians that are on, I, never underestimate the impact that doubling your dose can have. So when I say increased dose, I don't immediately mean residential or even an intensive outpatient. But, you know, we talk about dose all the time when it comes to medication, 20 milligrams of this, 40 milligrams of that. It rarely comes up in psychotherapy, but it should, because in this kind of a case, if you've got to be treating depression and OCD, to the, you know, at the same time, you may need two sessions a week to be able to accomplish that and never underestimate doubling your dose from one 50 minute session to two 50 minute sessions a week. The impact that that could have on a patient in particular, say, if they have comorbid depression. Mm -hmm. um, so it's quality well, and quantity. Yeah, I certainly think those are important. Jason, I'm curious, like, you know, when, when Brad's talking about kind of like splitting up the dose, uh, I guess in a single session, like doing the behavioral activation over here and then some of those OCD stuff over here, um, that seems a little counter to like the idea of let's not think about the diagnosis necessarily and let's think about these kind of underlying nodes. Um, well, it depends, yeah. though. I mean, yeah, I get what you're saying, but it, it depends. So there are some cases where it very much is the two entities are pretty dissociable, you know, in which case it makes total sense to do exactly that, where it's like, okay, this session is going to be more about targeting the OCD, and this, this session is more about targeting the depression. I was mm -hmm. kind of talking about there are cases in which it's it's less. It's like you can't really target the OCD without there also be depression stuff figured into it somehow and vice versa. So it just mm -hmm. depends. It depends on the person. It depends on again. That's why I keep coming back to again understanding them and their specific yeah. makeup as well as possible. What we've done in some instances is apply cognitive therapy when folks have severe uh, OCD and depression. Apply uh, teach them cognitive therapy skills, which can be really helpful for depression. In addition to doing behavioral activation. Um, and and then you can apply some of those cognitive restructuring skills also to, to OCD. We don't like to typically use them with OCD, but as a way of kind of, as, as Brad and I used to say when we would give workshops together, kind of tenderizing some of those strongly held, you know, obsessional fears. Yeah. And yep. then when the person is, is ready, they're feeling, they're using the cognitive restructuring to kind of reduce some of these thinking patterns we were talking about earlier. 
and also reduce some of their obsessional fear, then we we can do exposure and people are able to be more successful with it at that and point. It, and in particular, John, when you have people with limited to no insight, right? So yeah. we know that 4% mm -hmm. of people with OCD have no insight yeah. into their OCD. It's kind of this rock solid fear in belief system and in and cognitive restructuring or thought challenging can kind of help, as John said, tenderize that and, and kind of crack that a little bit so that you're better able to get in there uh, with with the ERP. The other thing I, I just wanted to quickly mention, you know, obviously we're psychologists, but if you've got patients who have uh, significant levels of depression, not only should you be trying to figure out, can I get a second appointment in a week or does this person even need higher levels of care than that? But obviously that would also be a time to consider referring to a prescriber. Yeah. Um, you know, an antidepressant medication can maybe give you a little bit of a two for one there. Uh, in particular, if, if it comes from a set of those serotonergic uh, agents, the SSRIs or whatever it might be that, you know, might be able to have not only an impact on the OCD, but that depressed mood as well. Um, just something to always be keeping in your mind. I mean, again, the vast majority of the patients who come to us for treatment are already medicated and properly medicated, but in an outpatient setting, not, not so much. Mm -hmm. Agreed. <clears throat> um, Katya at 12.54 asked, what about DBT? Um, which I thought might be an interesting question to throw at you guys. You know, we've talked yeah. a lot about ERP and behavioral activation. Um, is DBT something that you guys might think figures into this kind of comorbidity treatment? Yeah, I mean, for, from from my angle, again, you know, uh, I wouldn't necessarily apply DBT to OCD or even the depression. Again, I'm a big fan of the behavioral activation, but in our higher levels of care in particular, Kyle, there's a lot going on. And we do have DBT skills groups at the residential level of care, at the PHP level of care, because again, just in terms of mood regulation, um, these kinds of things, in particular, if there's any sort of self-harm or safety issues, DBT is a very helpful tool there. Jason, what did you think? Just, yeah, I mean, if, if the, back to the node, right? The networks, if the node right. is you know, right. just right. distress intolerance, yeah, sure. There are plenty of great tools from DBT yep. to apply to that. Yep, yep, okay. yep. I think of, of all the live streams I've done so far, this might be the most confusing. <laughs> <laughs> oh gee, thanks, Kyle. I appreciate it. <laughs> but the I best looking get invited back, Jason. The best looking. <laughs> the best looking, sure. But I, I guess <laughs> I've, it seems like, you know, when we're talking about this comorbidity, I guess when I was reading the literature or reading some stuff, it seemed kind of like, okay, like, yeah, the X percent have this comorbidity. We can try to kind of think of them as, or at least I've always tried to think of them as separate entities you can treat independently. But it seems like as Jason keeps coming back to, and I think is true at the end of this conversation, like it's really a person by person thing. <laughs> and like, you need to think, you need to go deeper than just kind of like the DSM diagnosis of like, did you hit these check boxes for this yeah. condition? The D Kyle, you and I have, have talked about this online and also offline before. The DSM wants to treat problems like OCD, depression, other other disorders as if they are, you know, specific, you know, kind of like all or nothing. You either have it or you don't like like COVID, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. You either have COVID or you don't or you have strep or you don't. But in nature, these things don't work like that. The psychiatric diagnoses, psychiatric disorders, psychological disorders, mental health disorders, they are not like COVID. There's not a um, in, in nature, they don't exist like that. There's more overlap. They exist more on a continuum, right? You either have COVID or you don't. There's not a continuum of COVID. But for depression, for OCD, uh, it's all it's more it's it's more complicated, as as you're saying, um, than than that. But I do think that um, I, I was a little I was a little surprised to hear you say that because I do think we understand the OCD depression overlap and how to treat it. Um, mm fairly well in relation to some other comorbidities that can happen with OCD. Yeah, that's definitely fair. I guess we did the OCD and schizophrenia live stream a while back. Right. Yeah. That's what I was it, thinking of. Yeah. That was a, a little less defined of a treatment. Um, just, you know, the more, as, as someone who's kind of like new to this field, I suppose, um, I feel like you're taught pretty early on that the DSM is really, really important. And then you talk to experts like you guys and it's kind of like, well, take everything with a grain of salt. <laughs> you know, it, it, I think the spirit of it, um, 
you know, is to try to continue to delineate these different diagnoses. I mean, keep in mind, 100 years ago, everyone had the same problem mm -hmm. and everybody got the same treatment. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's trying to medicalize the human mind and, and separate people out into piles. And I think to an extent it can be helpful. But to John's point, um, medicalizing the human mind is, is more challenging than it sounds. And nobody is, you know, kind of cookie cutter textbook kind of cases. People are a product of their past, their present. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of influences uh, mm -hmm. that have to be kept in mind. And, and, and those treatment plans have to be very individualized as a result. Yeah. Totally. Agreed. Yeah. Um, well, it is one o'clock and I want to respect your guys' time. Um, so thank you both for joining and, and John. Yeah, and thank you. Thanks so much. This was uh, a lot of fun. This is great. Yeah. This is a great one, guys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's been a lot of fun. I've definitely learned a lot. Um, just so that everyone watching knows, this is one of many live streams that the ISDF hosts. You can go to iscdf.org backslash. Um, wait, where is it? Live, oh, wait, no, that's donate. Live streams, that is, to see the entire schedule of live streams. Um, and also, we'd like to hear from you, so you can go to the iocdf.org backslash live stream survey uh, if you uh, have any thoughts or recommendations about what we can do different to be of more help. Thank you all for, for yeah, watching. Thanks so much. Thank y you. See you. Had a great time. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.